In this episode, should you ask a car salesman for advice? Yes. Wait. Really? You think? Just trying to convey a little enthusiasm up front. That's important. Okay. Correction, no, you should not ask a car dealer for advice. Not now, not ever. And here's why. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Shortly, we'll go live to Cletus in Shitsville again. But first... Today's episode is inspired by ordinary people. Yes, trusting fools who walk into car dealerships in the market for a new car and they make the mistake of asking for advice, which you should never do. Consider this. Recently, in the Northern Territory, a 41-year-old car salesman named Bradley Thomas Reeves pleaded guilty in the Supreme Court to 11 counts of obtaining benefit by deception after defrauding his employer, a car dealer, of nearly $470,000. These funds were deceptively pocketed from Hidden Valley Ford over a period of almost two years. Mr Reeves used them vigorously to pursue his favourite vocation, gambling. Stealing from a car dealer, that's almost acting as a latter-day Robin Hood, some would say. Only Mr Hood did tend to pursue the moral high ground by giving to the poor as opposed to, you know, just blowing it at the casino or something. So there's that. Apparently, Mr Reeves, consumed with self-loathing and fear, negative emotions of that ilk, he just walked into a police station and said, I'm not the Messiah, I'm a very naughty boy. That kind of thing. I'm paraphrasing. He dropped himself into it, basically. Mr Reeves' cunning scam... It's centred around giving customers his own bank details instead of the dealerships, into which they would then deposit tens of thousands of dollars when they bought new cars. He also offered customers big discounts for paying in cash, which he pocketed, of course. Additionally, he sold trade-in cars to used car dealers and kept the proceeds just for consistency, and he manipulated the dealership's commercial records to cover for the missing money and the discrepancy in cars. Mr Reeves told the NT cops he was a, quote, nervous wreck after the dealership's new financial controller started asking questions, presumably pretty inconvenient ones, such as, we seem to be missing half a million dollars and I can't find a bunch of cars. Do you know anything about that? Questions like that. A barrister named Helena Blundell, acting for Mr Reeves, said her client's cop shop confession was him, quote, making a cry for help. I believe she said this with a straight face, incredibly enough. Mr Reeves was an enthusiastic but quite poor gambler, so he ended each month bereft of cash and therefore he had to wind up the steam-powered deception scam machine to keep life in the copacetic gambling zone for the next four weeks. Miss Blundell said because Reeves had nothing to show for his crimes, he couldn't be considered as being motivated by greed. She also said this with an entirely straight face. I don't know how. If there is a moral to this story, I'm guessing the point is you walk into a dealership and you really don't know if you're interacting with someone whose moral compass is pointing towards Bradley Reeves or the Dalai Lama. I'm not suggesting for a moment that car salesmen are all deceptive scumbags, heaven forbid, with the recessive Robin Hood casino gene, 
but I am suggesting it's a damn good idea for you to manage risk and therefore be highly skeptical of everything you might be told inside a dealership environment. This is simply because you are vulnerable to exploitation in this place and ignorance is a primary delivery vector for exploitation. To the wrong car salesman, a request for advice is merely a red flag that you are ignorant on some critical subject and it represents nothing more than an opportunity for the ethically ambivalent to gut you. Even more worrying is wanting to believe. You know, you want this car, but you might need external validation to get that across the line. If the car salesman senses this, he might well give you all the validation you want. True or false, it's all going to be the same to him. Like, yeah, it's a great idea. Just sign here, mate. The pressure to sell in these places is immense. Car salesmen are under the hammer and it is relentless. Sell at any cost is often the mantra. And on the other hand, you want to make the right choice because then you have to live with it for three to five years. But a car salesman generally just wants you to buy a car, any car, but preferably one that's in stock and preferably right now, just sign here. This must take place, you know, before you drive down the street and compare his car with any other car from any other competing car company where you will interact with any other dude who's kind of just like him, who needs to gut you just as desperately as he does. This is clearly the wrong environment in which to procure advice. The risk is that the so-called advice you get will be entirely self-serving. It could be true or completely false, but it will most likely be dished up to serve the agenda of gutting you, you know, securing that all-important deposit and taking you off the market. You open yourself up to exploitation if you go on some quest for honest, impartial advice or validation in these places. Different rules apply. See, car salesmen exploit the phenomenon of truth dilation, which is an inevitable consequence of the general theory of bullshit relativity. S equals MC squared. Success for a car dealer equals mediocrity times cunning squared. This phenomenon bends the very fabric of space-time and accounts for the fact that the clocks on all dealership showrooms never move away from bullshit o'clock. It's always the time during business hours inside these places. Have you noticed? A lot of people don't. Our very own Professor Cletus Van Dam, whose groundbreaking research on bullshit relativity earned him the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2017, recently discovered the bullshit plausibility matrix. He joins us live on location from his laboratory in Schittsville. The bullshit plausibility matrix is the closest thing we've got to a science-based formula for success in the modern world. What you'll notice here is that this region of two-dimensional space, which represents modern discourse, is divided into several different sub-regions. So to define the space, we've got two coordinate axes. We've got bullshit on this axis going from zero to 100%, and we've got doubt, which is like the inverse of plausibility, on this axis also zero to 100%. And then we've got two key curves that describe discourse in the modern world. The horseshit hyperbola here in blue and the plausibility parabola here in white. You don't have to know the formulas for these, but you need to know how the regions are divided and where you want to sit in this matrix. At 80% doubt, or a coefficient of doubt of 0.8, you'll note that there is the straight face barrier. This is very important because everyone's different, but subjectively, when you experience 80% doubt, you won't be able to keep a straight face, regardless of whether something is true or false. This is important. Keep that in mind. And the one reason that politicians are not in the elite category here is that they just simply cannot see the straight face barrier. One minute, they'll be at a press conference and you'll be over here or something in reasonably safe territory, you know, a a moderate threshold of bullshit and low levels of doubt, that's nice and safe, and the next minute, they'll be right over here, they'll be up 
trending towards 100% doubt and all of a sudden none of the reporters in the room and none of the audience can just cop a bar of what they're saying because they've just stepped over the straight face barrier blind to it seemingly. This is a salient differentiator of nearly every politician in the universe. Below the intersection of the two curves at very low levels of bullshit here you can see about 20% bullshit and below about 80% level of doubt we've really got mundane truth and mundane truth is absolutely useless in the modern world. Everybody knows it, and that's why it occupies such a geographically small amount of real estate. Over here, even smaller, is unbelievable truth, beyond the straight face barrier, but still true. Talking about hawking radiation, leaving black holes, that's unbelievably true. We've got time dilation, defined by the special theory of relativity, unbelievably true. And we've got quantum superposition. Schrodinger's cat is in here. It's where the cat is simultaneously alive and dead, and nobody can define it until you look. So there's that. Uh, you can have fun with the straight face barrier as well, you know, having a few beers with your mates, that's allowed. You can be over here and one of your mates will say, up here, approaching 100% bullshit and definitely on this side of the line, one of your mates will say, mate, I once had a threesome with Angelina Jolie and Heidi Klum. Boom. Right there. We all know it's bullshit. It's beyond the straight face barrier, but it's a game. And if you're playing in an elite level at an elite level with elite mates one of them will say yeah but you only got that because i knocked them back first boom right very impressive and it's hard to raise the bar on that hard to up the ante all right so We've got the truth, we've got the straight face barrier, normal human discourses in this region, it's frankly unremarkable. We go through our lives and we just experience this all day long. What is kind of interesting though is what you want to do if you want to succeed because not all bullshit is the same. Anyone can slap on the bullshit, you can be at any level of bullshit at any region in this matrix, but to be an elite performer the secret is to drive down the threshold of doubt at the same time as ramping up the bullshit. So essentially you want to be, you could start off if you like in bullshit boot camp where it's fairly safe, but what you need to do is you need to swim up towards the light. And this is interesting. So from a research point of view, what we found is that things get really interesting above about 40% bullshit and down here on the low end of the doubt spectrum, because that's when you really are starting to get shit happening. And this would be like where job applications are. Job applications, if they're to be successful, need to be at least 40% bullshit. And the successful job applicant, you'll find that their coefficient of doubt trends towards zero. So success here, failure over here, getting a new job. Now, the same thing, Tinder profile up here, slightly higher, but the winner, the person who gets laid off the back of Tinder, is over here, driving plausibility up, driving doubt down, but ramping up the bullshit at the same time. Very successful here in the top left-hand corner of this region. Further above that, you've got Carmaker websites, and their challenge, I guess, is to bullshit by omission. But at the same time, drive levels of doubt down, like doubt about that Jeep's a shitbox, or the Captiva's a good car. All of these things are the challenge for Carmaker websites. Above this, you've got your spin doctor. Now, your spin doctor is a more elite performer. He's driving doubt down and doubt down all the time, and he has to do it on the fly. So spin doctoring is pretty demanding, but not as demanding, I think, as advertising agency or CEO, who's really up here in the second tier of bullshit excellent. Okay, so up here in the, in the elite performer, you've really got two categories of vocation that swim here almost without training. And they would be religion and car salesmen. Obviously, religion is up here because if you believe that you eat the wafer and drink the wine and you are actually consuming the body and the blood of Jesus, then the religious bullshitter has done his job. Objectively, this is kind of the same proposition as flying to Memphis and eating a carton of Oreos and drinking a bottle of bourbon and actually believing that you are consuming the body and the blood of Elvis. But I think you'd agree that that is way over here, 
still the same kind of level of bullshit, but beyond the straight face barrier and over here at an elite level, but one that's guaranteed not to engender success. So your car salesman is over here because he's really got to just banish all doubt and convince you to sign now, even though perhaps you don't want to, and you know it's going to get you in trouble or it's the wrong car and you don't really need it, all of those things. The only other level of the curve which we've been able to identify principally by mathematics first, we, we basically define this region as being bounded by 100% bullshit and 100% doubt, and then the mathematics told us about the existence of this zone up here which was only hypothetically postulated, and this is Z space, the zone of extreme desperation. This is kind of when you know you've got to have a crack at an explanation and you know it's not going to win, but you've got to try anyway, because where there's life, there's hope. So Z space is like this. Honey, I'm sorry about the mess in the kitchen. I'd been working in the backyard and I was filthy and then I heard a crash and I ran up the stairs, opened the door and then I slipped on the wet soapy floor and I fell straight into the woman from number eight. And then you came home inconveniently, unexpectedly from a business trip and jumped to exactly the wrong conclusion. <laughs> I mean, you know certain death is absolutely on the cards here, but you gotta have a crack anyway. The zone of extreme desperation do not go there if it can possibly be avoided. Just organize your life better. I mean, come on. Anyway, that is the bullshit plausibility matrix. If you observe these regions, train yourself in here, in bullshit boot camp, and swim towards the light. Everything will be okay. Back to you, fat man. Professor Cletus Van Dam. The Bullshit Plausibility Matrix is dedicated to the late Stephen Hawking, who would not have touched a crackpot idea like that with a 10-foot pole, and not just because he was paralysed. Fellow of the Royal Society, author of A Brief History of Time, Locasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University, the very chair that Isaac Newton once held, discoverer of the black hole radiation that today bears his name, proof that scientific literacy rocks, whereas being an emphatically dumb shit does not. Stephen Hawking, coolest of cool brainiacs, requiescat in pace, emphatically. I'm John Cadogan. Don't ask for advice at a car dealership. Make sure your kids learn science and mathematics because otherwise they might become pimps or politicians. And remember... The Bullshit Plausibility Matrix whenever you buy a car. Thanks for watching.